Hello and welcome back to Drinking About Birds, the show where we drink wine and talk about birds. My name is Zach. Today we are going to be talking about this wine from Crane Lake, which is a producer out of California, which is decorated with this kind of leggy looking wading bird. Uh, based on the name, you might think it's a crane. It's not a crane, it's a heron, uh, specifically a great blue heron, but that's kind of an easy mistake to make at the taxonomical broad strokes level. Um, there's a number of birds that have evolved kind of a similar long-legged, long-necked appearance. This is another great example of convergent evolution. None of them are that closely related. You have herons, which are in the order Pelicaniforms, in the family Ardeidae, which is herons, egrets, and bitterns. Uh, somewhat closely related to them, you have ibises, which are also in Pelicaniforms, but a different family. In various other orders, you have storks, you have cranes, you have flamingos. Evolution is a fairly conservative process in that animal bodies are very complex things and evolution works by random mutations and the most common effect of a random mutation in an animal's physiology or anatomy is that it just kills the animal or rather the animal doesn't develop to adulthood to begin with. So it's very rare to see like entirely new bones uh, forming or new organs coming into existence fully formed. What you see more often is changes in proportion. In the same way that you and like a giraffe have the same number of bones in your neck, the giraffes are just much larger. Uh, cranes have the same number of cervical vertebrae as other birds, they have the same structure of leg bones. It's just that some of those bones are very elongated, but birds that live in similar environments and have similar lifestyles uh, can have those same uh, modifications to their anatomy to make them better suited to that lifestyle. So, herons are not cranes, but that's okay. In fairness, they don't actually say it's a crane on the bottle. Uh, it's just called Crane Lake, so um, there is an older version of this label where they use a different illustration. I think they're still using it on one of their sparkling wines, and that one is a little more plausibly a crane, but this is uh, very recognizably a great blue heron. Uh, the great blue heron is a pretty cool bird. It is quite common and widespread in the United States. It has adapted to a variety of habitats. Most typically you see it in kind of marshes and wetlands and other surface waters, um, but you can see it in uh, oceanic coastal waters as well, estuaries, and it's uh, quite often found in upland habitat as well, so like agricultural fields, etc., uh, taking on more terrestrial prey. The majority of their diet is small fishes, and they typically use this hunting strategy of wading very slowly through shallow water and striking with sort of lightning speed and either catching small fish or in the case of larger prey actually impaling it with the bill uh, and then just kind of flipping it up to catch it in the bill and swallow it and really anything that comes within reach that they can subdue and then swallow is potential prey for a great blue heron so they also eat amphibians, uh, small turtles, rodents when they're in more terrestrial habitat. They will eat smaller birds. Uh, they have a, a reputation for going after ducklings. So sorry to sort of prejudice you against these birds right off the bat, but uh, again, a lot of uh, predators will eat ducklings given the opportunity, because why wouldn't you? <clears throat> they are quite a large and striking bird. Um, they're definitely the largest representative of the herons and egrets and bitterns that we have in the United States. They stand up to 1.6 meters tall, so like five feet tall, and they weigh up to 2.5 kilograms, so on the order of six or seven pounds. Um, so quite a large and substantial bird. And uh, that size combined with the plumage makes them pretty hard to mistake for any other bird. The typical great blue heron plumage is sort of slate gray slash blue. Um, on the head they have, uh, as adults, they have a white crown and then sort of a black stripe that runs above the eye and to the back of the head. Um, as juveniles, the white crown is kind of more gray uh, and that's 
one identifying characteristic that you can use to age them. But <clears throat> there is a population or a subspecies rather called the great white heron that lives in South Florida mostly and the Caribbean and they are actually white all over and so those are pretty easy to mistake for a great egret uh, which is another member of the same family but there are kind of more subtle differences that you can use to distinguish them. Members of those two different plumage groups can interbreed and they produce a hybrid known as Wurdemans, uh, which is more just variable. They also have these ornamental plumes, so these are body feathers that have grown very long and don't have much of a vein on either side of the shaft, and so they're just long and skinny and they're for ornamentation purposes, and those are found on the back of the head. There's a couple of them hanging down very characteristically in great blue herons, and then they also are found on the breast and the scapulars, which are where the wings meet the body, kind of on the back. Um, because they are often dependent on uh, aquatic prey, uh, many populations are migratory if they live in places where it gets cold in the winter, um, but it really depends on sort of the availability of food and sometimes that's not limited to aquatic habitat, sometimes they just switch to more upland foraging in the winter time, but a lot of populations in the northern United States and southern Canada will move a considerable ways south during the winter. And they will migrate as far south as like Venezuela, uh, the Galapagos Islands. The ones in the Pacific Northwest are non-migratory, uh, despite being found pretty far north, just because the winters are milder there. But yeah, This is a species where males and females, uh, once they are in a pair, actually share basically all of the duties of uh, constructing a nest, finding a nest site, it's thought that they basically just pick new mates at the start of each new mating season, so um, within a season they are uh, monogamous, and then once eggs are laid they both participate in incubating those eggs, once the eggs hatch they both brood the chicks, and they both participate in provisioning the young uh, for quite a long period after the eggs hatch. Um, this is a species where there is quite a long nestling period, and that's partly just because it's quite a large bird, and so it takes time for the little baby chicks to grow to their basically adult size uh, when they will be ready to fly and to leave the nest on their own and forage. The time between the eggs hatching and the young birds being able to leave the nest on their own is two to three months, and during that time the parents are quite attentive, they're feeding them several times a day um, if they're not actually actively uh, brooding the chicks. So there is a lot involved in raising a brood of young herons to independence and they will uh, continue, even after leaving the nest, they'll continue being fed by uh, the parents for a period of at least several weeks. And during that time they're learning to forage on their own but they're just not very good at it yet so they're kind of clumsy and not as successful yet at capturing prey. The nest in this species is actually a stick nest that they actively construct at the beginning of the nesting season. Um, it's uh, generally the males that bring sticks uh, to the nest site that's under construction and the female is responsible for actually placing those and constructing the nest so it's really a cooperative process. And they, it's kind of funny for such a big bird that we associate with just hanging out in shallow water, but they do nest um, at the tops of trees most often. And so you see a tree with just uh, a big old stick nest in it and a gray blue heron sitting on that nest. And they nest often in colonies that can be pretty huge, like dozens to hundreds of individuals, although typically they're not quite that big. And those colonies are placed where they have reasonable proximity to good food sources, but they also want to be away from predators, away from human disturbances. And so they're often in sort of isolated patches of woods or on islands where they're just a little bit less accessible than most parts of the surrounding landscape. <clears throat> and these colonies are often placed some distance away from foraging grounds, and so they have sort of a commute of potentially a couple of miles to get between the nest site and where they 
search for food every day, and that's often when you see them. Uh, they're pretty conspicuous when they're flying back and forth between nesting and foraging grounds because they don't look like other birds when they fly. So herons, one way you can distinguish herons from other kind of leggy wading birds is that they have this very characteristic S shape uh, to the neck and they maintain that when they're flying. So a lot of other long necked birds will just stick their head straight out in front when they're flying. Herons will kind of fold their neck back on itself and so there's this very pronounced S shape um, when they're flying. And they also have these long legs that are much longer than their tail and they just hold those straight out behind them when they're flying. And so I always think they look kind of like uh, just pterodactyls flying around. They have a very primal or primeval appearance. Uh, and it's always fun to see. I always enjoy seeing these guys in the summertime. And apart from when they're flying, they're not that hard to find. I mean, they're quite common. I think I saw one yesterday, most recently. Um, you can find them basically anywhere there's water uh, in the lower 48 United States during the summer. And uh, they're big, and so they're easy to spot, but they're also, they have this habit of staying very still for long periods. And so they're also potentially easy to miss if you're not specifically looking for them. There's about 16 species of herons and egrets and bitterns in the United States, so um, they're reasonably easy to find if you know a place that has kind of open water, marshy habitat. You will see herons. So this wine is definitely a budget wine. Uh, I got two bottles of this for about five dollars each, and this Crane Lake company is part of a larger winemaking company called Bronco, and Bronco became pretty well known in the early 2000s for a brand of wine called Charles Shaw, which was affectionately known as Two Buck Chuck because they had a distribution deal with Trader Joe's, and at Trader Joe's in California and a few other nearby states, this wine sold for $1.99 per bottle, and they had a, a, a reputation for like surprisingly decent quality that belied the very low price point. So Two Buck Chuck became pretty well known. Uh, this company is sort of unapologetic or even defiant for making uh, very budget-friendly wines. I found an interview with the CEO um, by I think NBC News, and he was like he's on record as saying like literally no wine is worth fifty dollars a bottle. Uh, anyone charging you more than we charge for a bottle of wine, it's just paying for their marketing and their promotion uh, to make you think the wine is worth more than it really is. And they have been able to produce wines at such a low price point, partly just by buying much cheaper land. Uh, they grow wine in the kind of the Central Valley of California rather than the the much more hyped up, well known winemaking regions where land is much more expensive, and so you're not paying for the land really. And they also just uh, exploit these economies of scale where they grow just a ton of grapes, process them in bulk, and you just kind of get what you get. And really, there's nothing wrong with offering inexpensive wine. I mean, it's like, if you go way down to the bottom of the price scale, some of the stuff is pretty awful, but you don't have to go <laughs> too far above that to find wine that's like decent and drinkable. There's quite a few places in the world where it's just sort of expected that you'll drink wine with dinner basically every night, and if you're buying wine that costs $20 a bottle, uh, that becomes financially unsustainable pretty quickly unless you're pretty wealthy. So um, there's definitely room for wine at this price point. This one is okay. It's a Petit Syrah, um, so it's a varietal. I don't really know enough about Petit Syrah to know what it's supposed to be like, but it's certainly drinkable. I wouldn't necessarily look forward to every bottle with like anticipation, but yeah, it's fine. Check it out if you find it. So that's all I've got for this week. Um, thank you for watching. Again, I'm Zach, and this has been Drinking About Birds, and I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you next time.